Okay, folk, it's my great pleasure to address you again this afternoon. Wonderful to see so many people here. And today I'm going to talk about the Fairy Delta II. And I've got a, a few other things that I want to throw in as well. Now, this photograph was taken at uh, RAF Museum Cosford in June of 2016 because there were two Fairy Delta IIs made, but there's only one that's been preserved in its original form, and that's this one here. And there's yours truly, because I was volunteering at Cosford at the time, and on this particular day for what they called the Air Day, but it was in fact an air show, uh, I was the explainer for the Fairy Delta II, so I'm talking to one of the, the visitors here. Now, it's just a magnificent aeroplane, the Fairy Delta II, and bearing in mind this aircraft first flew in 1954, when there were still a lot of Gloucester meteors around, it must have looked like something out of the space age then. So <coughs> its claim to fame is that in 1956 it captured the world air speed record. And it didn't just do it by a small margin, it beat the previous record held by a, an F-100 Super Sabre in the US by 300 miles an hour. So things weren't done in halves or half measures. So 1,132 miles an hour, 984 knots, 1,822 kilometres an hour, mark, point one, mark 1 1.731 at 38,000 feet where the flight was flown. And if anybody can think of any units that I've missed there, please let me know and I'll add them in. And it was flown by Peter Twiss, Lieutenant Commander Peter Twiss, who was Ferry's chief test pilot at the time from 1946 on. Now, two of these aeroplanes were built, and as I say, for some reason, the record-breaking aeroplane wasn't the one that was preserved. <coughs> we at Cosford have the other one, the second one that was built, and it is an absolutely magnificent machine and a masterpiece of aeronautical engineering, and I'll cover some of that. But the first machine that captured the record was converted to be used in the Concorde test program, in particular so that it could test out the wing shape. And uh, that's the ogival wing shape. Now, every, if anybody wants to pronounce that another way, that's fine but I'll show you all the references that I use to check on that. <laughs> so the, the BAC-221 was quite significantly altered from the original because, of course, Concorde doesn't have uh, wing root air intakes, so they had to relocate the air intakes underneath the leading edge of the wing. They added 1.8 metres to the fuselage just behind the cockpit, and they stuck it on a much longer undercarriage as well. And that particular example is preserved at the Fleet Air Arm Museum in uh, Royal Naval Air Station Yeovilton in the UK. So here's the two aircraft flying side by side, and you can see the ogival wing shape of the 221 at the top, and you can also see the, uh, the extended fuselage. Now, the interesting thing to me about the Fairy Delta II, of which the unmodified version is at the bottom there, is that that's a very simple delta. There's, there's no uh, sort of extra curvature or fillets or anything about it. 59.9 degrees of sweep back. Why they didn't go to 60 degrees, I'm not sure, but that's what it came out at powered by a Rolls-Royce Avon, and as you can probably guess, those two sets of figures there, one is the dry thrust, and the other is the thrust with reheat. And as with the Concorde, the nose of the FD2 could be drooped by 10 degrees, because as you saw from the header photograph, it had a very high angle of incidence, the fuselage that is on the ground, and you didn't actually get a very good view. So and the, that, that joint is a wonderful piece of engineering in itself because it's almost invisible when you walk up to the aircraft. The cockpit was quite cramped, according to Peter Twist. But notwithstanding, there was a vast amount of stuff that had to be fitted in there. 
So it's a pretty busy sort of a place. And as we'll see, I've got a copy of the pilot's notes. And I, I wanted to talk about those because there's something in particular that I find interesting about them. But as you can see, there's a vast amount going on in that cockpit. And here's part of the pilot's notes. Now, we're talking about a Mark II capable aircraft here at a time when that was pretty well unknown. But the pilot's notes are very much a work in progress. You can see that the fuel capacities have been overwritten. They've been handwritten on a bit of paper that's been stuck on. And there are some pencil annotations there at the bottom. And I just find it absolutely remarkable that an aircraft of this capability should have a set of pilot's notes that are still a work in progress. <laughs> now, the other thing that's interesting to me, if you have a look in the, the first line of the second paragraph there, about the, the word just after that uh, ink alteration is the word shoes. S-H-E-W-S. Now, these days, we would use the word shows. And I thought shoes went out with Shakespeare, but apparently not, because there it is in 1954. Now, here's a few bits and pieces about the Fairy Delta II. As I say, the remarkable thing aerodynamically about this aircraft is the simplicity of the wing. A single sweep back, there are no leading edge devices. There are no flaps. It's got ailerons on the trailing edge, which function as elevators as well. But no, no flaps. And despite the fact that it lifted off at 140 knots and could get up to at least 984 knots. Now, during the record attempt, the aircraft was still accelerating. So it, it had far more, far greater speed capability than was actually reflected in the speed that was reached. The second thing I find remarkable about it is that there are no variable geometry air intakes. Now I remember the gentleman Chris talked here some months ago in great detail about the variable geometry intakes for the Concorde, but not on the Ferry Delta II. They were just single geometry, nothing was movable there. One interesting thing I found in the pilot's notes, and again, this is handwritten in two or three places, that when you were supersonic, you couldn't use less than 7,500 RPM, otherwise you'd get intake buzz. Now, for those who may not have encountered that term, the, the intake ducts are fairly light sheet metal, reinforced, obviously, but the buzz that we're talking about here is resonance of those relatively lightweight ducts in sympathy with some resonant frequency in the engine. And one of the many reasons that you don't want intake buzz is that if it really gets going, it's going to pop the rivets out of the intake, which will then be sucked into the engine and cause the engine to fail. So that wasn't just an idle comment there. It made a hell of a lot of difference. The, the Ferry Delta II had cockpit air conditioning, but it really wasn't good enough because the external skin of the cockpit got up to 70 degrees Celsius, even on a relatively short high-speed run. And I've shown the quote there from Peter Twiss, where he said, luckily, the short, for me, the short, the high-speed runs were of short duration, otherwise I would have been cooked so he got out of the aircraft after, after each of these runs, and I think he was pretty glad to get out in many ways because it was very cramped, and because it was so hot in there, he was absolutely uh, drenched in sweat and uh, very happy to get a bit of relief. And he noted coming out of reheat, now we're only talking 2,500 pounds of thrust from reheat, and I guess it doesn't sound much, but then again, the, the meteor of not very much uh, earlier than that only had about 5,000 pounds, so it is actually a significant amount. But he was thrown forward when he came out of reheat, and he said, as I say there, it reminded him of catching an arrestor wire on a carrier. 
And similarly, when he engaged Reheat, there was that uh, very strong punch from behind as well. Now, I want to change gears for a minute and talk about a fairy aircraft of a slightly early era, earlier era, the fairy Barracuda. This was a carrier-borne torpedo bomber and dive bomber. First flew in 1940, entered service with the Fleet Air Arm in 1943, and it was a reasonably popular aeroplane. There were over 2,600 of them made. But as you can see, it's sort of I guess you'd call it more workmanlike than aesthetic because there's bits and pieces poking out everywhere. And the thing I like about this is that it's carrying a torpedo which was colloquially, colloquially termed a fish. Now this, these torpedoes were 46 centimetres in diameter and they weighed about 780 kilos, so it's quite a load. But this, despite what it may appear to be, is a fish carrying a fish. And I rather like that. Now, if you see that dark curved strip underneath the leading edge there, that's where the right main wheel has, has been retracted into the leading edge of the wing. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And you'll notice that this aircraft has a higher set tail. The first prototype had a lower set tail down on the top of the fuselage. But it was found for aerodynamic reasons that the tail needed to be raised, and that had an unfortunate and unexpected consequence that I'll talk about in a moment. So originally this aircraft was somewhat underpowered. It was powered with an early Merlin, supposed to be the Rolls-Royce X, but that project was cancelled. So they wanted a Griffin for it, but all the Griffins were being used in Spitfires and other things. So they had to settle for a Merlin, Eventually it got the Griffin and I think it was a much better aeroplane then. So as I say, it was one of the things that it was tasked to do was as a dive bomber. And you can see those Youngman Fowler flaps just under the trailing edge of the wing there. And when they were set to minus 20 degrees, as they are here, uh, you could dive the aircraft vertically and not exceed 260 knots. So that way it made a very a small target to be shot at. Now in this case here it's diving at an angle of about 60 degrees so not quite so steep. But in looking at the Barracuda which I must say has always fascinated me as an aeroplane I came across some very odd behavioural characteristics some of which had the ability to, uh, to cause fatal crashes. So what I'm saying here is that this was called a Barracuda, but even the aeroplane version of it could certainly bite. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the undercarriage, which was quite massive, and we'll see a shot of this in a photograph shortly, it retracted into the leading edge of the wing. Now, that doesn't strike me as a very good idea, really, because the leading edge of the wing is so important aerodynamically and the problem was that as you took off and retracted the undercarriage, the undercarriage retracting into the wing would spoil the airflow. It would disrupt the airflow, which would cause the aircraft to sink up to a metre. There's at least one recorded instance of where the pilot of a Barracuda took off from a runway and he retracted the landing gear too early. The aircraft settled back onto the runway under full power, and the pilot walked away, he was okay. But when they brought a crane to pick the remains up, the whole thing fell apart. <laughs> just, just that vibration from the, the full power engine and the propellers hitting the ground, or the blades, had just completely destroyed the structure. Now, hydraulic fluid leaks. Well, partly because this aircraft has such a massive undercarriage, they used what for the day was quite a high pressure hydraulic system. It ran at 2,500 psi. And it was very prone to leaks. So I guess we'd expect that. But it took 
two years from the time the aircraft entered service in 43 until 1945 to find the reason for a number of unexplained crashes suffered by experienced pilots. And what they found was that the pressure line for the hydraulic system leading into the gauge in the cockpit had a leak at the point where it entered the gauge. And that leak unfortunately sprayed hydraulic fluid right into the pilot's face. Now, okay, if you've got your goggles on, you could probably survive that under normal circumstances. The compounding problem here, though, was that this hydraulic fluid contained ether. So the pilot got a spray of anaesthetic at high uh, concentration into his face. He was rendered unconscious, lost control of the aircraft and crashed. So I think that's a particularly unique way of finding in an aircraft a way to take the pilot out and cause the loss of the aeroplane. Now, the, the third thing I've mentioned there, this uncommanded pitch down from skidding flight. Now, once again, that claimed quite a number of lives before the authorities uh, cottoned on to what was happening. And I read a report of one pilot who had this happen to him one day. He was just flying along in level flight. I think he was a bit bored by the sound of it because he was just peddling the rudders from one side to the other. And the aircraft was going along in a series of skids of increasing amplitude. So that's all right, except that it reached a point where suddenly the tail reared up, the aircraft entered a vertical dive, and it took him four and a half thousand feet to recover. And what they worked out was that the airflow against the, the tail due to the skidding flight was completely eliminating the elevator authority and of course the elevator in, exerts a down force in level flight to keep the aircraft balanced fore and aft so if you suddenly have no elevator authority you're heading downhill very rapidly and if that happened let's say that you are doing a turn from base onto final and you've got the turn uncoordinated in theory, and it, not just in theory, but in fact it did happen a number of times where the thing just dived into the ground. An American general had, I think, what is the appropriate last word for the Barracuda. He was being shown around the aeroplane, and at the end of that little tour he was asked for his comments. And he said, well, I think it's a wonderful aeroplane, uh, a wonderful flying machine, I should say, but it's never going to replace the aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk to you about something else now, the Air Transport Auxiliary in the UK. Now, as you can imagine, in wartime, there's a vast amount of need for aircraft to be flown around, say, in this case, within the UK. So aircraft to be flown from factories to squadrons, uh, from squadrons back to maintenance units, and just the general sort of logistical flying. So the ATA was created using civilian pilots so that rather than having to use operational pilots for this to take them off operational duties, civilians could be used, and uh, in fact the process was very successful. And in total, 1,162 male pilots went uh, through the program. There weren't that many uh, flying at any one time. But more interestingly to me, 168 women pilots went through this. Now, the women pilots had to have twice the number of hours in order to qualify for the ATA that the men had. They, they needed 500 hours as opposed to 250. And of course, these days, there'd be a clamour of people saying, well, why weren't there more women? But we're talking 80 years ago here. And to find 168 qualified women, I think, was quite remarkable. Now, one of the most remarkable things to me, too, is that these pilots typically flew five or six different kinds of aeroplane a day. And we're not talking about popping out of a 152 into a 172 and then into a Mooney 
and uh, you know, back into a, a uh, bonanza or something. We're talking about flying military aircraft, highly complex, and as with the Barracuda, uh, the ability to, uh, to bite you in the backside. So it was a very challenging thing to do. And also of interest to me was the fact that by the end of the war at least, the female ATA pilots were being uh, paid at the same rate as the men, and that was a first for the UK. So it was quite a groundbreaking situation. Now here's one of these uh, ATA pilots, Maureen Dunlop, and she became quite celebrated, not just for her flying ability, but she was also featured as a poster girl on the front of Post magazine. But the photo on the left there says it all, I think. There she is. She's got the pilot's notes for the Barracuda in her hand. She's got the parachute on the ground and all the other stuff, and she's preparing to fly this big, hairy-chested aeroplane. And I just think that's... Uh, very much to be commended. You can also see in that shot there the massive undercarriage, and that created a vast amount of drag, particularly when the aircraft was being landed. In fact, it was said of the Barracuda on final approach that it made as much noise as most aircraft make when they were taking off because of the amount of power you had to carry to, to counteract that drag. So Maureen Dunlop was one of only three ATA pilots to be awarded the Master uh, Air Pilot Award by the Guild of Air Pilots and Air Navigators. And uh, the other two were Diana Barnato Walker and Lettuce Curtis. So quite a remarkable lady flying quite a remarkable aeroplane. So let's talk now about Lieutenant Commander Peter Twiss. OBE, Distinguished Service Cross and Bar. And here he is in a photograph in period, looking every bit the steely-eyed and lantern-jawed test pilot that no doubt he was. And I've got a question for you. How could you become famous as a test pilot in 1950s Britain? Now, I'm not looking for the obvious answer here that you had to be a test pilot and you had to be in Britain. But, uh, OK, Barry. You looked at my presentation, didn't you? <laughs> exactly. Because in the five years after World War II, there were over 30 British test pilots lost their lives in flying accidents. Now, that was a particularly demanding uh, time to be a test pilot because it was when you were pushing up against the sound barrier and all of the issues related to that. But nonetheless, that's, uh, that's quite an attrition rate. So Peter Twist, he passed away in 2011 at 90 years of age, joined the Fleet Air Arm in 1939. He had an amazing flying career, and if you're interested, look it up because there's a lot on Wikipedia about him. Uh, worked on the Ferry Delta II project for a couple of years and flew 140 different kinds of aircraft. So, okay, that doesn't compare with Eric Winkle Brown, but then again, very few people do. So, uh, nonetheless, that's, that's a lot. And he was married five times, which suggests to me that he was just as fast on the ground as he was in the air. <laughs> so I was rather intrigued to find out what Peter Twist drove, because we've got to remember that these test pilots in the UK were household names back in the 50s. So in 1954, when the Ferry Delta II first flew, this is a couple of the, uh, the British family cars of the day. So we've got the mighty Ford Anglia 100E on the left there, being admired by a clutch of Morris dancers. <laughs> and then on the right, we have the indomitable Hillman Minx. So I'm thinking to myself, well, even though these test pilots weren't paid a whole lot, what did Peter drive? Well, he probably maybe drove a Bentley or some kind of uh, Jaguar, maybe a, an XK150 or something. But his choice was far more exotic. That's it. A Messerschmitt Kabinenroller. 
Now, I can well understand why he was drawn to this, because the canopy opens the same way as it does on the Ferry Delta II. And it must have felt, with the, uh, the tandem uh, seating position, a bit like a fighter pilot, but with only 200 cc's, somewhat slower than he was accustomed to. Now, <coughs> test pilots, in general, earn their keep very much. And in this era, they certainly did. And Peter had this particular incident before him in 1954. He was on climb out in the first ferry Delta II, passing through 30,000 feet, when the engine flamed out. And he couldn't get a relight. They later found uh, what, the, the, what had directly caused that, and I'll talk about that uh, in a moment, but, or at least show you a shot of it. But the fuel collector tank into which all of the wing tanks sent their fuel before the fuel was sent to the engine, that developed some kind of a, a pressure imbalance and it imploded. So that cut off the uh, fuel supply to the engine and it also cut off the hydraulic power to the flight controls. Now, this aircraft has two independent hydraulic systems for the flight controls, but neither of them work if the engine's not running. So they've got a slipstream-powered turbine that you can deploy that'll give you just enough uh, control authority to, to control the aeroplane. So he took this aircraft down from 30,000 feet through cloud back to Boscombe Down where it taken off from, and managed to make quite a high speed landing, all without power. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and here's the, uh, here's the collector tank. Again, this is from the pilot's notes with some handwritten annotations, just for good measure. So he landed on the grass at very high speed and saved the aircraft. It was out of commission for about 12 months being repaired, but nonetheless, it was saved very valuable prototype and he got the Queen's commendation for valuable service in the air for doing that. In fact at the time it was an article of faith with test pilots that you got a damaged aircraft back onto the ground if, if at all possible because he could have bailed out but then this thing would have speared into the ground and destroyed the evidence of what happened never mind destroying a, a, a valuable prototype. But you may have heard of Bill Waterton, who was a Canadian test pilot flying in this era. He was uh, the test pilot for Gloucester aircraft. He was flying the Gloucester Javelin prototype when he suffered aerodynamic flutter of the elevators and both of the elevators broke off. Oh, now, I, I have absolutely no idea how he could have done this without elevator control, but nonetheless, he got the aircraft back onto the ground in one piece. So, uh, pretty remarkable, really. So, there's a bit of a, a, a sting in the tail for the Ferry Delta II, because the aircraft, first of all, was being developed in Britain at a time when people were increasingly saying, we are no longer going to require manned fighters or manned interceptor aircraft. All of that sort of stuff is going to be done by guided missiles. Now, in 1957, in April of 57, Duncan Sands published what became an infamous white paper that essentially wrote all of this into law and as a result a lot of very worthwhile aircraft projects were cancelled. And Ferry could get no government what's, uh, support whatsoever in making this attempt on the world speed record despite the fact that if they succeeded as they did this would be an enormous prestige thing for Britain. So not only did they get no government support, but by this stage, that prototype had been allocated to the Royal Aircraft Establishment, and they had to pay rent to the RAE to use the aircraft for the, the record attempt. So the rest is history. They got the record, and, uh, but no thanks to the government. Now, during some of the testing of the FD-2, there were some claims for damage due to sonic booms, because some of this testing was done at low altitude. So it wasn't a whole lot. There wasn't a vast amount of money involved. But the government said, well, 
you know, in future, we are going to ban supersonic flight testing over the UK. You can no longer do it. So Ferry's engineers had a close relationship with Dassault in France. And Dassault said, well, look, why don't you move the testing to Cazot Airport in Bordeaux and there won't be any problem over there. They still had to take out insurance against claims for sonic boom damage, but that insurance in France cost £40, <laughs> so not a great impost. Dassault's engineers closely monitored the tests, and although their MD-550 later to become the Mirage 3, actually flew a little bit earlier than the FD-2, it resembled it very closely. <laughs> And I'm going to leave the last word on that to the head of uh, Dassault, Marcel Dassault. And bearing in mind that the Mirage 3 sold 1,421 units all over the world. So uh, it was uh, a very, uh, very successful aeroplane. But as I've put up here, Dassault said, if it were not for the fact that you British handle things in such a clumsy way, you could have made the Mirage yourselves. And that's an unfortunate uh, indictment of the, uh, the philosophy in the UK at the time, because the UK aviation industry had done so many wonderful things, Ferry Delta II included, but a lot of that came to nothing because of government attitude. So look, that's the end of me for the day. Thank you very much for hearing me out.